is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lockwood. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. UK inflation comes in hot. CPI returns to double digits as food prices soar. The Prime Minister Liz Truss faces PMQs today with her premiership in the balance. Streaming success shares a Netflix jump in extended trading thanks to better subscriber data after nearly a year of disappointing results. Plus, risk reversal. European stocks drop after jumping at the open. Inflation fears batter sentiment. So first thing is first, let's check on the markets. And we did see a bit of a rally. I had actually a couple of traders and messaging me. Thank you, Anthony. I know you're a loyal watcher. And every morning you say, this rally, will it hold? Will it not hold? Where this time you were right. If you look at European stocks, they're down two-tenths of a percent with, uh, I guess, that sign of confidence that the Bank of England gave yesterday. They're ready for QT. It will start a couple of days before that November 3rd meeting. The market was thinking, right, well, it means that they think they can pull it off. Now we go back to inflation inflation fighting BOE. So they're maybe not expecting the market chaos that we lost, that we saw in the last couple of days, but it does not mean that the road and path ahead is easy. Sterling 112.72, yen a lot going on, or at least a lot of speculation, certainly from fund managers, um, betting actually that dollar yen will move, putting pressure on the BOJ and then the U.S. 10-year yield 4607. Our Kathleen Hayes talking to James Bullard a little bit later on. That is a must-watch interview of the day. So let's also see whether we have a map of Europe to see uh, if there are any differences, for example, between the DAX unchanged, the U.K. down two-tenths of 8%. So it's a bit of a wait-and-see situation. I think we are seeing a reversal, certainly compared to how we opened up an hour ago because of inflation fears, but nothing too ugly on the market just yet. Now let's keep it on the UK. Inflation jumped more than expected to a 40-year high of 10.1 percent. It comes as embattled Prime Minister Liz Truss is due in Parliament where she's hoping to regain authority amid the fallout over her government's mini-budget U-turn. Let's bring in uh, Bloomberg's Lizzie Burton. So Lizzie, the inflation print and the BOE, it, it means that the BOE because of the QT um, you know, announcement yesterday is now ready to go back to flight inflation I guess with everything it has. Exactly. Andrew Bailey put in a confident foot forward with uh, this statement that QT is going to start after the Halloween budget, though not at the long end of the curve, because, of course, that's where the market turmoil happened in response to Kwasi Kwarteng's mini budget. But we are back in double digit inflation in September. I've just seen the Foreign Secretary, James Cleverly, uh, in Westminster. He has said that this figure is concerning. Uh, but for the Bank of England at its November meeting, the debate was between 75 basis points and 100 basis points. Uh, this might tempt some members of the Monetary Policy Committee to go for 100, but really markets have pared back their bets of a, of a really big hike uh, since Kwasi Kwarteng was replaced with Jeremy Hunt as Chancellor. The FT is reporting, Lizzie, that the UK Chancellor are also examining um, extending the windfall tax, rating the profits of bank and energy companies. So this is significant because it could also turn businesses against them, I guess. Indeed, and it's not, uh, it's, it's actually on top of the rise in corporation tax. Remember, that was the second big U turn that Liz Truss had to make. Uh, but these are the, as he put it, eye wateringly difficult decisions that the Chancellor Jeremy Hunt is going to have to make to fill that £40 billion hole in the public finances. And at the other end of the spectrum, uh, we've heard that he's asked all government departments, bar health and defence, to shave 15% off their uh, budgets. He hasn't promised to protect pensions, even though uh, we've seen this uh, inflation figure uh, really uh, squeezing vulnerable households that the Chancellor said they would protect. And pension is a crucial constituency for the Conservative Party. So when we get to Prime Minister's questions today, you can expect the opposition leader, Keir Starmer, to really focus on what he's dubbed austerity 2.0. And if the Prime Minister can't field those questions well, you, she might not make it to the end of the day. The Chancellor is going to uh, address Tory backbenchers at the 1922 committee at 5 p.m. later. Lizzie, thanks so much. Lizzie Burden there joining us, of course, from Westminster. I have to say the number of bets 
everywhere I look to on to how long the Prime Minister uh, survives is not a, a great benchmark of how long she stays in power. We're now joined by Jeremy Stretch, head of G10FX strategy at CIBC. Jeremy, I was going to ask you whether you took bets. I mean, I, I mean, we're kind of joking about it, but this is serious in terms of economic news because the U-turn the is incredible. I mean, we went from, you know, tax cuts, we're funding, we're fine, to austerity. So this is not even a U-turn. This is like a U-turn plus some. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I, I've, I've put out several notes over the course of the last couple of weeks headlined anarchy in the UK and it, it feels rather like that because we have seen this sort of completely anarchic relationship between politics and economics and the fiscal backdrop and the divergence between monetary and fiscal policy over the course of the last few weeks and if you're an international investor sitting outside the UK looking in then the UK doesn't look a particularly attractive place to invest and so unsurprisingly investors have been sitting on the sidelines or at least questioning as to whether they, the valuations in terms of sterling assets are appropriate. So, Jeremy, this is not only about politics, right? This is just the fundamentals of this country and what the Bank of England will have to do to get inflation under control. Absolutely. I mean, we had, after that uh, mini-budget on the 23rd of September, fiscal and monetary policy actually in conflict, and that was really one of the concerns that the market had. Now at least we're seeing fiscal and monetary policy getting back into the same page or the same construct in terms of the policy backdrop. So we're not seeing the sort of fiscal expansion that was really creating some of those problems in the Bank of England. But clearly the bank has difficulties ahead, and I think they will be forced to adjust policy by the most in the life cycle of the MPC, but we're looking for a 75 basis point hike from the MPC at the next meeting. Jeremy, I, and I know this is something that maybe is counterintuitive or a lot of people may, are not thinking about it that way, but if, if inflation needs to be under control, does the Bank of England really to have to put this country into a, a you know, deep recession, even if it could be short-lived, to make sure that inflation goes back? I mean, how much demand do they need to destroy? Well, of course, this is exactly the same debate that we're seeing in the U.S. And I think we are going to see demand uh, destruction in the U.K. because clearly uh, we're seeing you know, the, the, the average consumer being materially impacted by higher prices. Already we've got the impact of mortgage rates and those substantial number of uh, people are going to be mortgage refinancing at much higher levels over the course of the next 15 to 18 months. So I think we are going to see a fairly substantial downturn. We're looking for probably a one to one and a quarter percent uh, contraction in GDP next year. I think that's baked in. But I think the Bank of England isn't going to need to go quite as far as the market is pricing because I think the degree of demand destruction already that is going to be in place will reduce a substantial degree of those inflationary pressures. So what's your call on sterling for, from now until the end of the year and then 2023? So for the end of the, and from now until the end of the year, I think sterling comes under a renewed bout of pressure and uncertainty as we see this political maelstrom play out. So I think we may well see another dip back towards the sort of 110 threshold. Yeah. I don't think that's the... I, I, we could see what maybe, happens after that? Well, I think, I think we then find a little bit of a flaw. I think we, we I think the parity calls I think have moved away because I think the you know the, the normalization of fiscal policy I think reduces the parity threat, which was clearly writ large after the uh, mini mini fiscal event on the twenty third of September. I think towards the end of this year though we start to find a little bit of stability and I think we can see sterling coming back a little bit against the dollar through the course of next yeah. year. But I think we also see sterling potentially coming under a little bit of pressure against the euro, and I think that might be the better way to play it over the course of the next few months. All right, so Jeremy, don't go anywhere because we also have a great chart for you looking at the U.S. markets on edge over the U.S. housing market after a measure of U.S. home builder sentiment yesterday slumped for a tenth straight month. Our markets reporter Valerie Titel is here to take us through it. Valerie, I came in and you said, look at this chart, Fran. So what is it telling us? Thanks, Francine. Okay, so I have a chart on the exact data you mentioned yesterday, the Home Builder Sentiment Index versus U.S. unemployment. Now, the Home Builder Sentiment Index, as you mentioned, came in lower in a 10th straight month, but it's also posting the steepest decline on record, the fastest decline on record. So this is concerning because we know that housing tends to lead the U.S. economy, and I've mapped this versus the U.S. unemployment data. So if we were to look, let's say, at 2008, 2006, where we saw a, a huge deterioration in U.S. housing and unemployment rose, people are jumping to conclusions again we're seeing a very large drop in this sentiment. Does that mean, with the lag, of course, that we'll see uh, unemployment rising? Now, yes, this chart might be concerning, but, but the one bright spot I can point to you, Francine, which is in my next chart, is that some people will say that the U.S. is less exposed to housing, and they point to things like the fact that residential construction spending now versus in 2006 is a bit lower. And we know that housing, the housing market generally, is a bit less leveraged. So that's the argument that poses maybe the U.S. economy you know, can, can weather a housing downturn. You know, we've
we've heard uh, from Bank of America and those results, for instance, that, that the U.S. consumer is still strong. So maybe things like that, compounded with the fact that we're a little less exposed to housing uh, going forward, means that the U.S. economy could weather the storm. Valerie, thanks so much. Valerie Titel there. Now, you can see Valerie's charts, of course, on all terminal analysis via GTV Go on the Bloomberg Terminal. You have some great little numbers that you can type on your own. I think make them your own. Steal Valerie's charts. I highly recommend that. We're back with Jeremy Stretch, head of G10 FX strategy at CIBC. Jeremy, you also don't need, like, a PhD in economics to understand that maybe everything's a bit skewed because of COVID. So we're seeing consumer spending holding strong until... What needs to happen for that to completely fall off a cliff? Well, you're absolutely right. We're seeing consumer spending holding up. But I think some of those narratives in relation to the housing market and the impact that we're going to see on higher prices in terms of discretionary spending, I think are going to come through and come through quite quickly. I, I was particularly interested by that chart just being shown there about the Home Builders Index and the flow through into unemployment. I think one of the big things in terms of the U.S. dynamic is looking at that substantial fall that we saw in job vacancies over the course of uh, the last month or so. That's, again, a little bit of a siren call to suggest that the labour market is showing some signs of fragility. If we see that reflected in terms of the Beige Book uh, when that's released tonight as well, then I think that's consistent with a moderation in activity, and I think that will start to stem some of the more extreme assumptions in terms of Fed rate, where Fed rates are going. And I think that will play into the narrative of the dollar story starting to lose a little bit of momentum as we go into 2023. I don't believe that. With the dollar, not, I mean, it just feels like there, there's everything supporting it, unless the, the rest of the world picks up. Well, well, in a sense, I think, I think that's true. And in a sense, what we've seen, of course, is the dollar has been the only story in town through the course of the right. last 12 months or so. It has been the growth story. It has been the interest rate story. It has been the safe haven flow. So I think if you start to take away some of that momentum in terms of the macro story, we take away some of that dynamic in terms of Fed tightening expectations, then I think you end up with a situation where the market is already relatively long of dollars and you start to question yeah. whether you should add or extend some of those flows. And I think also if you start to see some of this moderation, or we can see this moderation in terms of gas prices continue, now of course that's a big if, yeah. But if we are going to see this moderation in terms of European gas prices persist, yep. then that takes away some of that negative narrative for the Eurozone uh, right. equation as well. Um, talking about big ifs, what happens in Japan? I mean, the, the story there is absolutely incredible. Does it, you know, d does it force, does yen force actually BOJ to do something? Well, it's interesting. I mean, just as I was leaving the office, I was just looking at the 10-year you know, JGBs, and it appeared to be the case that yield curve control wasn't quite <laughs> operating in the way that it was intended or as we would have expected. Now, clearly, we're getting... Well, we, we, we've been heading inexorably towards this big line in the sand at 150. Now, the question is, is that going to be the, you know, that, the threshold that's going to prompt the, the MOF back into the market? But the ultimate bottom line is that if you're talking about solo or unilateral intervention without dealing with the fundamental reason or rationale as to why the yen is cheapening up, i.e. the BOJ are in the completely opposite spectrum to every other global central bank, it is very much the case that throwing money against the, uh, against the dollar yen cross is going to be a relatively, you know, sort of, you know, sort of almost throwing money into the air because you're not going to get anything other than a short-term reaction. So the question is, are the Japanese going to allow that yield curve control threshold to moderate and perhaps even without necessarily adjusting it formally, but just allowing those, those rates just to edge up a little bit? And that might be one of the precursors to seeing something yeah. of a top in terms of dollar yen. I would suggest it's, it's maybe the more exciting country right now. I know well, it's controversial. Well, it's, yeah? well, it, well, well, I mean, we've been, waiting, we've, been waiting for a con we've been waiting for a consistent period of Japanese inflation for the last 30 years. Now the BOJ have achieved it. Kuroda's achieving his aim towards the end of his tenure. But you have to question as to how, uh, how that's come around and whether it is actually a, a beneficial story for, uh, for Japan PLC. Jeremy, thank you so much. As always, Jeremy Stretch, the thank head you. of G10 FX Strategy at CIBC. Now, coming up, Netflix returns to growth as Hollywood breathes a sigh of relief that the worst may be over for the streaming giant. More on that in a moment. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. Now, Netflix shares jumped as much as 16% in extended trading after the streaming giant returned to growth. It follows two quarters of falling subscribers. Hit shows like season four of Stranger Things helped it add 2.4 million members, beating expectations. So, for more on all of this, let's get straight to our Berlin-based tech reporter, Aggie 
control. Aggie, I'll ask you what you're watching at the moment in just a second, but it does seem like the worst is actually over for Netflix. Yeah, it does seem that way, especially when it comes to the subscriber growth. Essentially, what we're looking at is um, the, the subscribers are growing again after two quarters where it was seen as this was a driving figure for the, uh, the successes of the company in the last couple of years. And now we saw a drop in the first half of this year. That seems to have been done away with. But what's interesting to hear from Netflix uh, is that they are also saying that they're not going to be focusing so much on subscriber growth, but rather the top line is going to be about the revenue going forward. This is also incorporated into the fact that they're, cons uh, they're bringing in a uh, advert uh, advertising-based model as well for, uh, that will be priced uh, cheaper than the non-advertised uh, uh, version of Netflix. Um, and essentially, that's going to incorporate, be incorporated into their revenue as well as the cost of subscriptions and also partnerships going forward. So it's a potentially growing into a more mature form of media uh, product okay. than purely based on subscription growth. So, Aggie, what about this dollar dilemma? How is that impacting revenue? Yes, so essentially uh, Netflix as a global company and a company that is keen to get subscribers all around the world is obviously concerned about the pressure on incomes across the world, especially with a strong dollar and what that means for other economies. And so now we're also seeing that, especially seeing as this platform has engaged with a huge amount of investment in local language content in places like Korea or where I'm sitting in Germany, and they're keen to get subscribers from other parts of the world, essentially what we're seeing now is that they would need to make sure that those subscribers are able to continue paying for these uh, uh, subscription models even when the cost of living is potentially squeezed. Thank you so much, our Aggie Cantrell there, Bloomberg's tech reporter. Now coming up, cranking up the pressure, UK consumer inflation comes in hotter than expected. Ahead of the UK Prime Minister trying to reassert her authority in Parliament. We'll discuss that next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, let's return to our top story this morning. UK consumer inflation coming in hotter than expected. September CPI hitting 10.1%. It comes ahead of the embattled Prime Minister Liz Truss appearing in Parliament later. Let's bring in Bloomberg's John Stepek. John, you're here because you're also launching a new global newsletter focusing on wealth. So how do you save me money if I subscribe? Which, by the way, I have in the UK. Inflation back in double digit. What does that mean for consumers like you and me? It's really unpleasant, Francine. Um, I mean, I'm glad to hear you subscribe. Thank you very much. Um, but yeah, so this is, you know, inflation's at a 40-year high, back at a 40-year high. Um, you know, it puts more pressure on the Bank of England to raise interest rates. And at this stage, whether it's three quarters of, you know, a percentage point or a full percentage point, kind of doesn't matter. Interest rates are going up anyway. And in the meantime, the government's not going to help us out as much as it was hoping to help us out because we've got Jeremy Hunt and a new kind of austerity light -like type approach to budgeting. So really, I think the important thing for consumers and investors to understand is that the world has changed. Um, this is, you know, the new normal. We can't expect uh, to, to sit and wait and hope that the era of ultra low interest rates and low inflation comes back because it's not going to come back, certainly not anytime soon. It doesn't mean that inflation, inflation is going to be in double digits, you know, for the next 10 years, but it is going to be much more volatile. And that means that you need to take a much more active approach to managing your personal finances. Yeah. But, so, John, is there anything that people can actually do to shield themselves apart from spending less? I mean, obviously spending less is one option, but if you're looking for something that's a, a bit less kind of depressing, um, I mean, there are a few kind of minor silver linings here at the moment. With interest rates going up, the savings rates have gone up as well. So you can get better rates on your cash. It's not going to keep up with inflation by any means. Um, but for example, you can get savings rates of upwards of 4%, sometimes 5% now. So if you haven't moved the cash in your bank account recently, do shop around and take a look. Um, another kind of silver lining, which uh, is something that uh, people coming up to retirement may want to take a look at, 
um, is annuity rates. Um, now, annuities um, have been basically out of favour with pensioners, um, you know, since uh, the, the pension reforms that allowed everyone to draw down the retirement pots. Um, and that's because low interest rates meant that annuity rates were extremely low. Now, they have started to pick up again. It doesn't necessarily mean that they were the right thing for you, but it's certainly something to start considering again if you are coming up for retirement yeah. or even in retirement and want to look at your uh, options for getting an income uh, over the longer term. Um, yeah. And I mean, other than that, there's also, you know, it, it, your mortgage is probably the other kind of big thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that's the thing that's going to be scaring a lot of people at the moment. And, and that's yeah. understandable. But it is scary, you know, like interest rates have shot up on mortgages in a very short space I of know. time. We were looking down <laughs> like more than 6%. It, it is pretty scary. We'll, we'll get more on that. For the moment, I think a lot of the mortgages are fixed rates. But then I think it's middle of next year where some of those start uh, trailing off. Our John Stepek. We'll have plenty more, of course, on the UK. But we'll also talk crypto next to this is Bloomberg. UK inflation comes in hot. CPI returns to double digits as food prices soar. The Prime Minister Liz Truss faces PMQs today with her premiership in the balance. Streaming success, shares in Netflix jump pre-market thanks to better subscriber data after nearly a year of disappointing results. Plus, risk reversal, European stocks are mixed after jumping at the open, inflation fears better batter sentiment. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, we need to look, of course, at Pound. We had a good conversation with Jeremy Stretch on the fact that after the mayhem, after the chaos that we saw not only in Sterling, but in Gilts over the last couple of days, we're going back to fundamentals. And fundamentals don't look that good if you're the BOE right now. So we had that 10.1% inflation, double digit, still at a 40-year high, but it was even higher than expected. That means that the market may be currently pricing in uh, sterling, well, a bit lower as Bank of England increases rates um, by maybe a bit more than they were pricing in yesterday. We also had news yesterday of that QT. Uh, the main question there is how much QT translates into interest rate rises. Now, it's been a tough year for crypto with prices crashing and questions over its environmental credentials persisting. The industry is also facing increased scrutiny from regulators for its high energy consumption at a time when many countries are struggling to keep the lights on. We're joined by Adam Back. He's chief executive uh, officer and co-founder of Blockstream. Adam, thank you so much for joining us because Blockstream actually also added so much in the equation. I know you, you can't walk in the street without people coming up to you and asking you questions about how it all started and where cryptocurrencies are going from here. Let's maybe start in El Salvador. What did El Salvador teach you about the usage of crypto going forward? Well, I think an interesting story with El Salvador is um, kind of encouraging foreign direct investment so that they see a new rising sector and offer kind of offshore incorporations for crypto exchanges and things like that. And so I think it has been a success story for them as increased tourism and um, they've adapted it as uh, a second legal tender as well. I mean, there's also been, you know, questions, question marks and concerns about what it means longer term. Do you think the, I don't know if El Salvador is kind of, you know, a template of what others, you know, also just as small countries can do um, and whether that would be a positive or a negative? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a positive. You can see sort of similar things historically with Dubai uh, offering free trade zones for international companies to operate in the Middle East and Singapore, areas that are kind of phasing out natural resources or coming up in the world. D does it only work in countries where they don't have a strong belief in, in some of the fiat currencies? Well, it certainly brings it to, to the fore of their mind more readily because they're relying on international remittances with high fees. They have uh, unstable inflationary local currencies. But, of course, in the West, we're you know, experiencing inflation for the first time as well. So I think that's opening more people's eyes. I mean, when you look at inflation and some of the market chaos that we saw in the UK and also you know, other parts of markets worldwide, is there really a case that uh, some of the cryptocurrencies are more stable going forward. Does it change the equation? Does it make it more mainstream? Um, well, I think it, it means that people are looking to preserve spending power because they're thinking that their savings will be going back at double digits per year, just standing still. And it's very difficult to 
yeah. figure out where to put it. Stocks, bonds, everything looks uncertain. So while uh, Bitcoin is um, still in the early phases of adoption, so it has some volatility, it at least has a growth story. Yeah. Um, and I know one of the things that you're you know, talking about is lightning and liquid, which is basically you know, something that is meant to make Bitcoin payments faster. And right. cheaper. H how far along are we in that infrastructure? Um, yeah, the Lightning, which is for sort of retail and micropayments, is really undergoing very rapid adoption, sort of double digit percentage growth month on month, and a lot of development activity. And that drives the kind of use cases you see in El Salvador, kind of more payment focused. Mm -hmm. But do you think that will accelerate significantly if you're looking at cheaper payments, at faster payments? Then, you know, does it start rivaling some of the big credit cards out there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think the payments use case is more seen in emerging markets. And in the West, you more see Bitcoin as a savings technology or inflation hedge. Um, you're here for a digital assets conference. What's the mood like? Well, I mean, the, the markets, um, you know, Bitcoin and the wider market is in, in some disarray. But uh, the financial institutions actually seem to be, you know, steadily planning for the future and adding support for Bitcoin related products, so offering the ability to buy Bitcoin with your brokerage account or with your savings account, that kind of thing. Yeah, are, are a lot of the conversations on sustainability and you know, electricity usage going forward? Um, I think there's some misunderstandings about that. For example, uh, you know, the power that's generated is usually built to peak capacity. So typically, a, a, at least 50% of power is unused. And we do some mining in, in Canada, in Montreal, and that province has all hydropower, about 50% unused. And actually, you know, it's difficult to buy power because it's a government corporation, but there's enough unused power in that province to power the entire Bitcoin network. Okay. So there's actually a lot of surplus green power in the world. That's all hydro. But and is that even true? I mean, we're looking at, you know, record prices for energy. We're talking every day about the cost of living crisis. So d does that change because of some of these inflationary pressures that we're seeing and the scarcity of energy? Well, I think the problem is that it's difficult to transport energy over long distances, right? So Canada is, has a very low population density. There's 65 hydro dams in that region. There are other countries with such kind of imbalances of population to power generation. So Bitcoin sort of seeks out the low cost, environmentally friendly power, basically. You've also joined forces, I think, with Jack Dorsey in Texas. Yeah, so we started a solar and uh, battery um, powered Bitcoin farm. And so it's under construction at the moment. And the point there is that Bitcoin is a, uh, a sort of buyer of last resort, which makes power generation projects more profitable earlier in the cycle. And so uh, it makes it easier for projects to get project financing yeah. to build green power and ultimately sell that onto residential and industrial use. So it's uh, the solar install is done by Tesla and it's using the Tesla mega packs. And, and so, this is, so this is entirely solar. And do you see this being replicated in other states? Yeah, so I mean, our thought is to, rather than having people debate about policy, to just yeah. build a project, open the finances so people can see the economics of it, and then replicate it much larger. Okay. Adam, great to meet you. So you'll have to come back and, and we'll talk a bit more about this. Adam Back there, Chief Executive, Officer and Co-Founder of Blockstream, uh, joining us. A reminder, of course, you can access also all of the latest data and news on crypto on the Bloomberg Terminal, going to CRYPGO on the Bloomberg Terminal, CRYPGO. Coming up next, we'll be joined by the Nestle Chief Executive, Mark Schneider, to talk about earnings at the Swiss food giant. Stay with us for that exclusive conversation. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, Nestle sales are surging as the world's biggest food and coffee maker pushes through the largest price increase in decades to try and shield the hit from inflation. Now, group prices are up some 9.5 percent, while volumes fell over the quarter. Let's talk and look at some of the brands underpinning its success. We live, of course, in a world of artisan caffeine. Nescafe Instant remains a huge money spinner for Nestle. There's also the boutique offering of Nespresso coffee pods. It's one of Nestle's high-margin products, but volumes declined in European sales have dropped after a strong 2021. Now, better news for Nestle's dog food brand, Purina, which is helping to drive growth. Pet food has done phenomenally well these past few years, 
partly due to a rocketing pet ownership during the pandemic. I am, of course, uh, very tied to both pet food and also coffee. We're delighted to be joined now by the Nestle Chief Executive Officer, he's Mark Schneider, for an exclusive conversation. So, Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I mean, it is pretty incredible that you've, you know, passed on the biggest price rise in decades. Are you worried that people will buy less, that people will not be able to afford your products, especially in Europe? Uh, good morning and uh, thanks for having me. Good to be back on the show. And um, look, this is a situation that uh, no one wished for. And uh, what we're trying to do here is protect um, our margins from some of the same pressures that every family feels. So we are seeing uh, that huge upward pressure coming from energy, some of the agricultural commodities and, uh, and also transportation costs. And we're not even passing everything on because as we saw with our half year numbers, our gross margin has also been reducing over the last year and a half. So in a sense, we are struggling to catch up. And um, uh, understandably, these numbers get all the headline, but uh, they're only partially recovering some of no. the additional cost pressures that we're seeing. But Mark, we're seeing you know, different government support in terms of different countries in Europe. So are there countries where you worry more about consumer backlash? because of increasing prices, just because inflation is too high for them and their wages aren't following? So far, we've seen only very limited uh, trading down. Um, I think the big unknown, especially for Western Europe for the fall and winter, is energy insecurity and how hard that is going to be hitting uh, households to disposable income after energy costs. And that's the one where we are watching very closely and seeing how the fall and winter will play out. I mean, when do you find out whether consumers are switching to white labels? If, if you look at the trajectory, again, of consumer spending, of the cost of living crisis, of energy prices, of the winter months, where do you think or when do you think uh, peak consumer angst is? Well, when it comes to white labels, do keep in mind um, we're not only offering premium brands. We have brands across a number of price points. And so when there's trading down, it doesn't mean we lose that consumer. Uh, we may be able to have a compelling offering uh, at a different price point. We are also promoting more in terms of value pack and uh, larger pack sizes. With the white label, you've seen a bit of a uh, recovery because uh, most of these uh, private label brands have been suffering a lot uh, during COVID times. Some of their supply chains weren't holding up as well as with the branded goods manufacturers. So some of the recovery there was already ongoing. We now need to watch over the winter exactly how the situation unfolds. So, Mark, when you look at uh, all the products that you offer, all the categories, which category do you think is more resilient to price hikes? I think in general, um, those large um, uh, key categories we have, like coffee and pet gear, tend to be very resilient. We know that from past crisis and also from other markets around the world. So clearly, uh, there's a lot of um, uh, allegiance here to these brands and to these products. And uh, I think that bodes well under the circumstances. I mean, to protect your margins, there are you know other things that you could do and increase you know for example making some of the packaging s smaller or the size is smaller but at the same price point, has that been done? Will it be done? Well, a key part for us was to actually look internally and see where we can find efficiencies so that not all the pressures here that we saw on the gross margin arrive um, at the bottom line, and so a lot of internal cost savings have happened over the last year and a half. And then we also have undergone a very aggressive program, uh, which we call cut the tail to push the head. So this is low rotation SKUs being phased out in favor of high rotation, more successful core SKUs. That helps to improve supply chain efficiency. And the other thing uh -huh. is uh, it really improves visibility of those core offerings. So it helps sales down the line. So your volume measure, which is basically real internal growth, actually contracted in the fourth quarter, but on the nine months, it, it was rising. What does that tell you about price pressures? Well, I think it's important that we're living at a very volatile time and that we don't interpret the volume development only in response to pricing, because we're also lapping very, very strong quarters from last year due to a very strong COVID demand. People were still spending a lot of time at home in third quarter last year. And so that's where it makes it so hard to read. Some of it is simply the high level of comparables. Some of it may be the earlier response to some of the pricing. Some of it is supply chain constraints. 
And some of it is what I mentioned earlier, and that is our voluntary phasing out of certain SKUs uh, as we're trying to seek efficiencies to offset inflation. Uh, Mark, talk to me a little bit also about the outlook for wage inflation next year. So how much will that erode profitability? How much do you have to increase wages of your workers? That's a very important question. We're watching this very closely. In most countries, uh, those negotiations for 23 will unfold over the winter and during the first quarter. So it's very hard as of this point to give a precise estimate. Every country, of course, has its own calendar, but uh, this to me is a key item to watch out for during the winter and beginning of 23. I think you also said that you were suffering supply chain constraints, for example, in the water business and in North America. Can you give us more details on that? Yeah, so North America is mainly around our pet care business. As you know, that business has stepped up tremendously during COVID times with so many people adopting pets and, uh, you know, a one-time significant step up in demand and then good continued growth on top of that. Uh, so here we're adding capacity, which should come on stream uh, later this year and next year and help to alleviate the situation. Water, uh, interestingly, when it comes to carbonated offerings, CO2 has become scarce as uh, some of the industrial gas producers have less CO2 available, we were supply chain constrained uh, in that area. Is there anything that you can do to protect yourself against some of these uh, supply chain constraints? I know you were quite good at dealing with them during COVID and lockdown. Yeah, and look, it's the same recipe now. Keep your head down, focus on your operations, uh, focus on the daily block-in tackling. So when I look at the way we run the company now, it's a lot more operational down into the weeds and the details compared to the time before when there was more time available for longer-ranging strategic thoughts. Now it's really day-to-day -day trying to make sure that these um, supply chain constraints uh, remain limited and do not morph into bigger problems. I mean, do you expect them to, to potentially morph into bigger problems or, do, or does it actually ease in 2023? I think what we're seeing now with some of the economic activities slowing down, um, I think I'm seeing a slight improvement on supply chain issues around the world, especially when it comes to global shipping. So some of the traffic and the demand is down and uh, I think that's helping to ease things. But I think it's too early to call this like um, an end to the crisis. So it's something we still watch very closely. And then hopefully, uh, you know, as we go through the rest of this year in early 23, um, that easement trend will continue. Yeah, and actually, same question, Mark. I don't think, I mean, I know you talked a little bit about wage pressure and wage inflation, but overall, when are you expecting inflation to peak? Does it get worse in 2023, overall inflation, before settling down? Yeah. So. What we're clearly seeing is some of the inflationary pressures continuing. So this is not over yet, and some of this will kind of go into 23. Uh, when exactly it's going to peak, I think a lot of that has to do, especially in Western Europe, with the energy situation, because that's a big driver of inflation and also, of course, has a big impact on our cost position and our manufacturing and distribution cost. So that's the big unknown. But some inflation will certainly continue into 23, even just because of the full year effects of the rises that we have seen in 22 so far. Um, Mark, where do you plan to position Seattle's best coffee? Is it going to be high premium with other brands? So to us, this is a very exciting uh, brand that we got to know through our Starbucks Global Coffee Alliance uh, that we struck in 2018. It is positioned less premium compared to the original Starbucks brand. It's more of a mainstream mid-range uh, brand, very trusted in particular in the United States, uh, building, of course, on Seattle's reputation as being one of the core places uh, to get a good coffee in the United States. And um, so we came to like this brand a lot, and it, it helped to also cover the gap price point wise that we had before and so very excited now to get complete ownership of this brand and to continue to develop it going forward. Um, I've been talking about coffee Mark and getting a good cup of coffee what happens with Nespresso can you increase prices of Nespresso capsule is there a limit to how much people will will pay for those capsules? So, of course, being faced with the uh, levels of inflation we're seeing, we also had to adjust prices there. Um, the good news is that uh, the basic interest in the brand and uh, portioned coffee or capsule coffee uh, continues to be unabated and very strong. Um, what you're seeing when it comes to growth rate compression is mainly due to the very, very high quarters uh, that we're lapping from last year. Uh, that was unavoidable because, as can imagine, 
people working from home, consuming coffee from home, portion okay. coffee was the go-to solution. And now as they move back to the office, we're seeing some of that ease. The fundamental underlying demand is still very strong, but very bullish on this brand. Yeah. Mark, I was actually looking at my shopping basket, right, you know, grocery stores, and I was trying to think what I was going to cut. So do you have a crystal ball and, you know, if things get worse, if people need to save, let's say, 10% of their spending, and you look at a shopping basket, which one of your products would they buy less of or, or change to a cheaper brand? Everyone, of course, would love to have that crystal ball. And again, the situation right now is pretty volatile and very, very hard to read because you're having the economic uncertainty, you're having some of the inflation that had, uh, happened already, plus then you have these very, very uneven and volatile year-over-year -year comparisons due to the pandemic. Uh, my personal guess is it's not so much about cutting one thing or another. It is mainly about, uh, you know, some of the trading down, so more of the trading down that we started to see. And that's why it's so important that we offer uh, brands at different price points. The other obvious one in food is if you need to make ends meet, um, eating out less is um, a quick way to do that because the value proposition between a meal in home and a meal out of home is, is vastly different. And of course, out of home yeah. is also hit by the labor constraints and some of the rising labor costs. Mark, thank you so much. And subscriptions to, to uh, cooking recipe websites increase. Mark Schneider, the chief executive of Nestle, of course, on these results. Now, coming up, the UK Prime Minister prepares to face Parliament with consumer inflation hitting a 40-year high. We'll have plenty more on that shortly. This is Bloomberg. starting to break markets where previously we've been very poor. So you know, the, the United States is currently flying you know, with Formula One with its new, uh, newfound popularity. And so, and of course, out of that comes commercial revenues um, by attracting new partners and commercial partners to, you know, into the sport. So it's a win-win it's a, it's a scenario. Is there more that can be, can be done on that front to grow the fan base? No, absolutely. I think we're just scratching at the surface and what we're seeing is more and more youngsters coming to sport, more and more young girls coming into following Formula One. And I think that's a, a really encouraging thing. And I think that, you know, once they come to look at it, the most important thing is to keep them engaged. Mm. Uh, so the racing's got to be good. The product has to be good. It has to stand up for itself. It has to be inclusive. Uh, it has to tick all of those, all of those boxes. Well, that was the Red Bull Racing Team Principal Christian Horner speaking with her very own Tom McKenzie at the F1 team's headquarters. And you can watch more of that interview on Power Players, a new show where we speak to some of the most influential figures in the world's sport. More Bloomberg Surveillance up next. I think there's some, a, a genuinely large cloud of uncertainty out there. A lot of factors are putting us back into a more traditional 1970s, 80s, and early 90s mindset. We believe that these markets require patience, diversification, and discipline. There's so much fear out there, and it's been priced in. We're priced for a lot of bad news. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller, and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong. Our top stories today. 40-year high, UK inflation returns to double digits, intensifying pressure on the government and the central bank to act. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Truss faces Prime Minister's questions with her premiership in question. And return of Netflix. Shares in the streaming giant surge as subscriber growth signals the worst may be over after a string of disappointing results. Plus, Wall Street continues to add headcount. The biggest US banks are expanding their workforces even as executives talk of cutbacks. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. And Kaylee, uh, European equity markets kind of losing momentum as we go through today's session, a strong dollar and higher rates in focus. Yeah, and they were the focus too in Asia overnight where we definitely didn't see that much momentum coming through after two days of rallying here in the United States. It was a mostly down day for Asian equities. You did have some outperformance coming from Japan, but with losses in China and Hong Kong, the MSCI Asia Pacific Index as a whole down about eight tenths of one percent. And a lot of that was dragged 
uh, the drag led by technology. The Hang Seng Tech Index down about four percentage points for likes of Alibaba, Tencent, JD.com, all of those big weights on the Asian session. Again, comes back to that higher rate story that Anna was just talking about. And on the subject of higher rates, we are seeing upward pressure on bond yields globally, and Japan is not immune to that. Take a look at the 10 year JGB yield. If you have your Bloomberg terminal up, it'll show you that it's 0.257%. What is that above the 25 basis point cap that the Bank of Japan would like to see on that 10 year JGP yield puts Kuroda and co in a very difficult spot as we continue to see the Japanese yen weakening against the US dollar. It is weaker once again this morning. 149.44 is where we trade. We are pushing near 150 on dollar yen. Quite a puzzle for Japanese policymakers. But of course, that's not a yen exclusive story, Matt. Pretty much everything is weaker against the US dollar. Today. Yeah, we do have the dollar up today for sure, but still fascinating to see the yen getting back close to that uh, record weakness. We have S&P futures down, although only marginally, and it does look like it's the UK inflation numbers that pushed us down. We had been up on futures throughout the night, and we finished up in the cash trade yesterday, more than 1% to about 37.20 on the S&P 500. So much better than the 3,600, 3,500 levels that we've been seeing um, over the past few weeks. The U.S. 10-year yield is coming back up as investors let go of that debt. It's both a tailwind and a headwind for stocks. Obviously, investors feel comfortable enough to let go of the perceived safety of government debt. On the other hand, as these yields rise, um, they become uh, a bigger competitor to stocks for returns. The Bloomberg dollar index, as Kaylee mentioned, uh, gaining 1343 is the level here. And we have the dollar up against most major currencies today. So dollar strength um, often a problem for stocks that could hold back a little bit of a rally. And NYMEX crude, I just wanted to point out, Right now, we're trading at just $83.04 for West Texas Intermediate. And we've seen um, lows around $60, highs at $125. So as we talk about the SPR story today, keep in mind that we're still at a relatively low end of the range that we've seen for oil over the past year or so. Anna, what do you see in terms of European stocks? Yeah, well, this is the picture for European stocks then, Matt. It's pretty red, pretty red across the board. The CAC came on fairly flat, but elsewhere we're seeing uh, selling of European stocks in the main. I should mention the Dutch market actually up by four tenths of 1%. Tech stocks to the fore there. Broadly speaking, an interesting data point just dropping on the Bloomberg, the Euro area September inflation number coming in at 9.9%. This is a revision down from 10%. That's the number we previously had in mind. This is the final reading. So at the margin, perhaps a little bit of good news if you're looking for uh, those numbers to come down the fact that we're the right side then of that 10% double digit mark not so in the UK more on that uh, in a moment this is what we're seeing on a couple of UK assets and this is the the yield curve we've got here for you on gilt so the two-year yield here the 30-year yield here and you can see they're moving in opposite directions and that yes there's inflation number here but there's also uh, the fact that we've heard from the Bank of England and what they plan to do with quantitative tightening it is going to be starting almost exactly at the time it had been planned give or take a day or so but what's interesting is they're not going to be selling at the long end only at the short end and so in anticipation of that short end supply, you see some selling going on there and those yields pushing higher. So that's what we're seeing, that flattening of the yield curve, reflecting expectations around QT in the UK. The other UK story is, though, as Matt mentioned, what's going on in inflation. We'll get more on this from Lizzie Burden shortly. But really interesting to see the way the dollar gains, the pound sells off, as if the market is not really thinking about links between that inflation print and hiking central banks and therefore strengthen the pound. They're instead thinking about what that means in terms of weakness in the UK economy. Here's the German two-year yield because we saw an incredibly weak, um, uh, uh, we saw a, a, a weak auction when it came to the seven-year uh, part of the German debt curve. Uh, but I put this in here because we're seeing actually more movement at the two-year. We are seeing uh, some selling and some yields going higher. That seems to be the broad story across what we're seeing in, in the European debt markets today. And Lloyd's in focus, this is the banking group, down by 4.3% today. As we see the Chancellor in the UK getting ready to try and find all of that missing money, essentially fill the holes in his fiscal uh, his fiscal uh, plans is he going to turn to energy companies is he going to turn to banks to try and increase taxation there there's already a surcharge on the banking sector above and beyond what is normal on corporation tax uh, that is something that those uh, in the city are going to be pushing back against but it is for the moment that fear weighing on banking stocks now let's stick with themes around the UK and go to Westminster as UK inflation returns to double digits jump back over that 10% mark then for more we're joined by Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden who has the focus on that inflation print for us. Your thoughts, Lizzie? 
This is driven by food price growth, Anna. We're back to where we were in July, a 40-year high, and significant that we're in double digits. I'm sure that there are members of the Monetary Policy Committee at the Bank of England who will be tempted by this to vote for 100 basis points, perhaps. But I have to say, uh, since Kwasi Kwarteng was replaced as Chancellor with Jeremy Hunt, markets have pared back their expectations from that 100 basis points, and now it's back to a debate between 75 and 100. We've also learned, as you say, from the Bank of England that they are going to get on with quantitative tightening after the Halloween budget, but they're not going to do it at the long end yet, which for me is a statement from the BOE to say we're reprioritizing this fight against inflation. We're not forever going to be a backstop for the government, but we have got a firm eye on financial stability, hence the compromise, because of course it's at the long end where you saw that market turmoil after the mini budget but this really is a confident statement from the Bank of England Governor Andrew Bailey. You have to wonder how many people are going to actually dress up as Quasi Quartang's mini budget this Halloween. Uh, Lizzie the Financial Times is reporting that the new chancellor could raid bank and energy company profits. What does that mean for the competitiveness of the UK? Well, when you factor in that the one of the other U-turns that Liz Truss has had to do was uh, that she's actually going to raise corporation tax and you throw in uh, employment taxes as well, UK Finance is warning that London could be less competitive than other financial centres like Frankfurt and New York. And this at a time when Liz Truss has raised the stakes and said that her premiership is going to be all about growth, growth, growth. Uh, so it's a very difficult uh, challenge to meet. But, of course, Jeremy Hunt really needs to plug this £40 billion hole in the public finances. At the other end of the spectrum, we're hearing that he's asked all government departments, bar health and defence, to shave 15% off their budgets. He's not even guaranteeing that he'll protect pensions when pensions are such an, pensioners are such an important constituency for the Tory party. So Liz Truss facing Prime Minister's questions later today. She'll have to hope that she can give the performance of her life because Hunt is meeting backbench Tory MPs at 5 p.m. today. If she can't pull it off, could be curtains for trust today. All right. Well, we'll look forward to your reporting throughout the day. Bloomberg's Lizzie Burden from Westminster. Thank you so much. Meanwhile, here in the U.S., Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says the Fed can't pause hikes if inflation is still rising. If we don't see progress in underlying inflation or core inflation, I don't see why I would advocate stopping at four and a half or four, seven, five or something like that. So essentially four and a half percent doesn't necessarily mean they're done. And later today, we'll get another take. We'll hear from St. Louis Fed President Jim Bullard, who will be speaking with Bloomberg at 3.30 p.m. New York time, 8.30 p.m. in London. Anna. Now, Netflix shares are up after the streaming giant stemmed its subscriber losses in the third quarter. Hit shows like season four of Stranger Things helped it to add 2.4 million members, beating expectations. Reed Hastings, chairman and co-CEO of Netflix, spoke yesterday. Well, thank God we're done with shrinking quarters. So that's the big feeling of we're yeah. back to the positivity. We still got FX, so that's a huge hit, uh, you know, as we've explained. So... Uh, that's not going to go away. Um, but other than that, the, all the stars are lining up very well for us. Reed Hastings there. Let's get the latest then on this business. Aggie Cantrell joins us, our Berlin-based tech reporter. Aggie, is the worst over then for Netflix? Can we say that after they've turned this corner? So essentially, when you're looking at uh, the subscriber numbers for this quarter, that has massively beat estimates. That's incredibly important for Netflix, especially seeing as that subscriber growth has been such a metric that they have stuck to for so long. It's been crucial for them to indicate their growth. And for the last two quarters, that has been very bad for the company. Um, so going forward, they're also projecting further subscriber growth over the holiday period, over the fourth quarter this year. And that's going to be, uh, that is an important figure for them. Mm. But it's also it's also interesting to point out that the company themselves have been saying now that they're moving away from talking about subscriber growth as a key focus. They're going to be looking more at revenue as a whole. This is also incorporated into the fact that the company is now looking at uh, bringing in an ad-based option for people who want to pay a lower uh, amount but will also have ads per hour um, on the platform. And so they're now looking at focusing on top-line revenue more than they are on subscriber growth. 
Okay, Aggie, so they'd like us to look at the top line, but what about the bottom line and when it comes to profitability, especially considering the stronger dollar? What kind of dilemma does that pose for Netflix? So they have flagged the fact that uh, sales and profits will be impacted by the stronger dollar. And it's important to note that essentially Netflix sees itself as a very global business. It's got local language content in a huge amount of the countries in which it operates. And that in order to get uh, subscribers not only in the US but overseas as well, they also are concerned about the price pressures on consumers, um, especially in a time when uh, incomes are being squeezed and when inflation is essentially uh, requiring people to look at their pocketbooks and see where they can save money. And so in order to go forward and gain more subscribers and uh, gain better, uh, more revenue going forward, they need to make sure that uh, they're able to offer something at a price point that people can afford. Aggie, thanks very much, Bloomberg's Aggie Cantrell with the latest on that particular tech, uh, tech story. Over to Wall Street, Wall Street banks, the biggest U.S. banks, keep adding to their workforce, apparently, even as executives talk of scaling back. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, City, J.P. Morgan and Bank of America, that's almost all of them, isn't it, all reported increased headcounts for the quarter. Of the six largest U.S. banks, only Wells Fargo cut the size of its staff. Bloomberg's Charlie Wells joins us now for more. Charlie, good morning again. I mean, we know about the tightness of the labor market broadly in the United States. Uh, we thought that things were going to look a little different, perhaps, given the rhetoric we've heard from banking executives. Well, this is really striking because it, for some <clears throat> deals teams at some of these banks, it had been an incredibly slow spring, mm. an incredibly slow summer, and the fear was that the guillotine was going to fall in the autumn. But the numbers just aren't showing that. It seems like the guillotine may be going in a different direction. So at five of the six largest banks, actually headcount was up on the quarter and it was up on the year. If you zero in on Goldman, actually compared to last year, their headcounts up 14% from last quarter. It was up 4.5%. Now that's 2,000 jobs. This is despite the fact that, of course, Goldman has brought back those coals, those annual performance reviews to take low performers out of the firm. That doesn't seem to have started yet. That hasn't seemed to trickle through just quite yet. In terms of uh, rates, in terms of FX, the traders have really made a huge difference in revenue this quarter, saved the, saved the quarter um, in a lot of instances. Yeah, Matt, that's a good point. So the traders have sort of saved the deal makers here. Um, and they've actually given trading desks their best third quarter um, ever. When you, look at, uh, at, when you look at rates and when you look at currencies, if you look at the five largest banks on Wall Street, their fixed income trading teams brought in revenue that was up 22%. So that beat expectations. If you look at Bank of America, they had no trading loss days. And that is pretty striking, especially when you compare that, of course, to investment banking fees across Wall Street. Those were down over 50%. Now, that's, this takes us back to that question that we were talking about before about jobs. When do we start to see some of these teams that have literal tumbleweeds blowing across their <laughs> floors start to see some headcount reductions? All right, Bloomberg's Charlie Wells, I can see that image. Thank you so much. Now let's get back to the U.S. equity markets and take a look at some stocks moving in pre-market trading, one of them being United Airlines. It reported after the bell yesterday, and it's more about the guidance. It's guidance for profitability in the fourth quarter earnings per share. That nearly double what analysts expected. They expect EPS of between 2 and $2.25. So that is giving a nice lift to the shares. It really underscores the demand still there in the aviation space. United up about 6.2% before the bell. Now, of course, we also just ran through Netflix's numbers with Aggie. I would note, though, that it's not just translating into Netflix's shares, which, yes, are higher in pre-market trading this morning, but the more positive view on subscriber additions is lifting other streaming-related companies as well. Roku up 3% and Disney up about 2.5%. It is a very different story for one stock, though, and that would be Olaplex. They make hair care products like those fancy shampoos. It cut its outlook for the full year, citing a slowdown in sales momentum, and you are definitely seeing a big impact on the shares in pre-market trading down a whopping 42 and a half percent before the bell Anna. Wow, that is a sizable move. Coming up on the program then, Kaylee, we will get to what's happening in equity markets more broadly. Beata Manthi joins us, head of European equity strategy at City. What are we braced for over the winter? And the White House is open to releasing more crude from U.S. emergency reserves. More on how that could affect the midterm elections ahead. The politics of oil, of course. This is Bloomberg.
Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York. Anna Edwards with us out of London. We are taking a look at the front end of the curve right now and the spread between historic terminal rates and the two-year yield. Historically, it's pretty big. Um, it's been diminished of late, but right now, if you take uh, what the market is predicting as the peak rate of almost 5% and the two-year yield, it looks like we have a long way to go. Another 50 basis points higher, maybe we could eclipse 5%. Joining us now is Ven Rom, Bloomberg Markets Live team leader, to tell us about um, his theory that we could see a pretty big return on the two-year uh, two treasuries. Ven? Morning, Matt. That's absolutely right. I mean, we've got, uh, you know, two-year two -year treasuries have had a miserable year so far, and it looks like that's going to continue because, as you said, you know, with a five percent, with a five percent terminal rate, uh, two-year yields will climb to about five forty-five by my calculations, and that's what the history shows. And that is predicted on a five percent terminal rate. Now, the terminal rate has been a moving target in this in this cycle, as we have seen. The Fed started with a terminal rate of two point one percent at the start of the year, if we remember. Now that's push, being pushed up to four point six percent, and the market surprising five point five percent. And if inflation continues to force the Fed to keep going, i.e., if the terminal rate is pushed out to say five and a half or six percent, then sky's the limit on the two-year yield. Really, I mean, we could go to much, much higher than five percent. We had Mark Mobius say on Bloomberg TV the other day that interest rates may go to nine percent. Woe betide it if it happens. There will be chaos in the markets. Mm, yeah, nine. That was a staggering call from him. Then, thinking about the UK gilt market then, it's been quite a journey in recent weeks, of course, up and then down again in terms of those long-end yields. Now it seems that the gilt curve is pricing in what the Bank of England says it's going to do. Is that what's driving things? We've had the inflation print today, but of course the Bank of England has set out their QT plan and it doesn't involve the long end. Absolutely, and I think that the markets are moving much more to what the BOE is going to do going forward. And uh, the BOE's terminal rate, as priced in by the markets, is much higher than even the Fed's. And the markets are looking at 530 and probably 550 for the BOE. And we are at the BOE is at 225 now, so there's a long way for the BOE to go. And it's a similar story for the front deals. We have had a miserable year for front end guild deals, and they're going to face yet more losses. And as you mentioned, um, the QT is going to be focused on the front end, which means even more supply for the front end to con confront, and that will push yields much higher. So we are looking at, you know, uh, a much more volatility, realized volatility, volatility on the front end. Ben, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Ben Ram from the Bloomberg Markets Live team. For further market analysis, check out MLIV Go. That's the function to use on the Bloomberg terminal to find the Markets Live blog. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Kaylee Lines with Matt Miller in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now keeping you up to date with news from around the world, here's the first word. Ukraine's military claims 13 drones made in Iran were shot down in the Mykolaiv region overnight. It happened as officials have reported more attacks against the country's infrastructure. The Biden administration is pressing Congress for new authorities to speed up production and transfer of weapons for Ukraine. Hong Kong Chief Executive John Lee has unveiled a plan to woo back foreign talent and ease housing woes. It's an attempt to revive the city's status as an international finance hub. Lee announced he would cut property duties for non-permanent residents and relax visa rules. Years of tough COVID-19 policies and political turmoil have triggered a brain drain in the city. And Mitsubishi UFG Financial Group is said to be evaluating an acquisition of some loan portfolios from Credit Suisse to expand its U.S. business. Japan's biggest lender is also betting bundles of the Swiss bank's global loans in various sectors. Credit Suisse is racing to raise funds with just over a week to go until the unveiling of a critical turnaround plan. And of course, Anna, that plan could potentially include thousands of job cuts and a significant reshaping of the business. Mm. Yeah, we wait for a fuller picture of that reshaping of the Credit Suisse business. Not a day seems to go past when we don't have a story about somebody circling for something at Credit Suisse. When we come back, we'll talk to Beata Manthe, head of equities at City. We'll get uh, a take on European stocks. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. 40-year high, UK inflation returns to double digits, intensifying pressure on the government and the central bank to act. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Truss faces Prime Minister's questions with her premiership in question. The return of Netflix. Shares in the streaming giant surge as subscriber growth signals the worst may be over after a string of disappointing results. And Wall Street continues to add headcount. The biggest U.S. banks are expanding their workforces, even as executives talk of cutbacks. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kayleigh Lines in New York. And Matt, European equity markets finding it hard to, to continue the enthusiasm we've seen over the last couple of days today, although the focus has been on a recovering or at least resilient profitability story from global corporates, but also a strong dollar. Yes, and the concern, of course, in Europe has really been the inflation picture. That also dragged U.S. futures down for about an hour, but we're back up into positive territory. Take a look right now at S&P futures, up just two-tenths of 1%. But after a pretty strong close yesterday, we were up 1.2% to 37.20 on the S&P 500 yesterday after a couple days of very strong rallies. Um, so we could see further gains in just about four hours when the U.S. equity market opens. Investors are willing to let go of the perceived safety of government debt, although that does mean that the 10-year yield climbs well over 4%. In fact, you can still find 4% yields across the curve. And we just heard Ven Rom saying he thinks the two-year is going to go to five. That could be a headwind for equities as then uh, bonds provide a, a pretty serious competition in terms of returns. Uh, Bloomberg U.S. dollar index gains today of about three-tenths of 1%, 1343.50, the level we can see it gaining against most most major currencies and Kaylee was just showing us that the yen is now trading at almost 150 per U.S. dollar. So real weakness uh, there. And then NYMEX crude right now up about 1.2 percent. 83.80 is the level. So relatively low in the range that we've seen over the past year between about $65 and $125 and yet we're talking about releasing more oil from the Strategic Petroleum Reserves. We'll hear about that a little bit later on in the program. Kelly, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, we got to talk about some of these earnings, Matt, including from Netflix after the bell yesterday. Maybe the worst is indeed over. At the very least, they are no longer losing subscribers after two quarters of that. They added 2.4 million subscribers in the third quarter, plus they expect to add another 4.5 million more in the current period. So yes, you have some dollar headwinds at play there, but overall, Investors seem pretty positive on the picture for Netflix now. The stock is up 12.8% before the bell. Also a big move for United Airlines after its own uh, report and forecast for the current period. It thinks profit in the fourth quarter is going to come in more than double what analysts had anticipated. So that stock up 6.2%. Pretty strong picture in the airline space right now. Intuitive Surgical also beating on the top and bottom line. It's up about 10% before the bell, but plunging to the downside is Olaplex. They make shampoo and other hair care products. Seeing slowing sales growth momentum, though, cutting their full year forecast as a result, and that stock down a whopping 42% or so before the bell, Anna. So those are big moves, not such big moves now overall when it comes to European stocks. Half an hour ago, we looked and we were, we were negative across European equity markets. We started out in positive territory, so we've been fluctuating. Now we're pretty flat, really, across the European uh, stock 600, entirely flat, let's say. Uh, we have some strength to the technology sector. Certainly that's lifting the Dutch market, some weakness in the banking sector in the UK. So some divergent moves across different geographies. Here's a bit of the UK story, though, in the shape of the uh, gilt curve and the different uh, moves we're seeing at different ends of it. We've got the Two-year yield at 3.6, the 30-year at 4.17, moving in opposite directions. We heard from the Bank of England they are planning to redo or get back to that quantitative tightening path as they focus back in on inflation. And it is going to be pretty much on the schedule that we thought, but they're not going to be uh, putting some of those long-end bonds back into the market. They won't do QT at the long end for the time being because of the volatility we've seen at the long end of the curve, and so the market adjusts accordingly. This is the German two-year yield. I put this in here because on the GMM function, this one stood out as being the more outsized or unusual move uh, in terms of what we're seeing on sovereign debt markets this morning. But it was the seven-year where we saw record low levels of demand, actually, in Germany, although I should say those records only go back to the middle of 2020. But still, weak demand coming through for that issuance. Concern about, on a European context more broadly, not just in the UK then, whether we're going to see indigestion in bond markets, Kaylee, if we see governments issuing, of course, to shore up the consumer and also seeing the ECB slowly, slowly pivoting towards QT. 
Okay, so a lot of questions remaining in the UK bond mar market for sure, Anna. Let's talk about how that translates to the equity market. Beata Manthe, head of European equity strategy at Citi, is joining us now. Beata, you have 10.1% inflation in the UK. Major questions around the fate of the bond market, the fate of the new government, fiscal policy in general. Why do you favor it here? Very good question. Indeed, inflation came uh, a little bit above the, the market expectations in line with, with city economies forecast, to be fair. And, you know, what it means is that the Bank of England will continue to hike. So we expect 75 basis points uh, hike at the, uh, at the next meeting at the beginning of November and, and further hikes uh, going down the line up to around 4.25 uh, terminal rate. But of course, perhaps it's, it, it sounds counterintuitive that despite all the chaos that has been happening in the UK bond market recently, actually we continue to favor the UK market. But what you have to remember is that the UK, and I'm talking FTSE 100 here, is really not a play at all on the UK economy. Actually, there is almost no relationship between the direction of the EPS for FTSE 100 and the direction of the GDP for the UK economy. It's the most mm. international market, 70% revenues come, uh, comes from abroad. Plus, this, so the most obvious transmission mechanism and the most important transmission mechanism is really the weakness in the pound, which is helping these big multinationals. So we continue to. Yes. So this UK is our favorite value market, continues to be. OK, I, I wanted to ask you about that, Beata. Yeah, you have to go down to the smaller caps, don't you, to get a reading on the UK economy. But thinking about the, the strength of the dollar and what impact that has on your universe, we obviously heard from Netflix overnight, and that plays into this theme that the strength of the dollar does hurt some of the big multinationals in in the United States when they bring those those foreign currencies back into dollars and you've talked about how it helps some of the big UK multinationals does it help other European businesses eurozone businesses or are other, are, are other factors just bigger than the assistance they would be getting from the strong dollar well and that dollar strength in the risk of and shrinking economy is not good for anyone right so uh, just about the US equity market can can weather it a little bit better. But when it, so as I said, the UK has the biggest share of multinationals and revenue coming from abroad. But actually for the Eurozone, it's around 40, 45% down from the 70% for FTSE 100. So you also have companies that do benefit uh, from the weakness in, in the Euro. And that's something that our um, city um, equity research analysts are highlighting a lot. And it, it is at, uh, at the core of the year themes for, for relative bullishness on some stocks. Be Beata, we talk so much about monetary policy that it almost makes you sick. And we don't hear as much about fiscal policy. Are, do you expect that we're going to see some big moves, especially, you know, big European shared debt? So that's a very fair point. And of course, everybody is betting on the scale of stimulus that could help to limit the downside because I don't think anybody at that point doubts uh, that the Eurozone uh, economy or UK economy is going into recession or is already in the recession, right? But what worry our uh, worries our economies is the reaction function of the market to the big fiscal uh, stimulus out of the UK and the U-turn that the government had to do on it. Of course, what it does, it's, uh, now limits, uh, uh, it now takes the floor from the downside. That means uh, worse uh, contraction in GDP and probably a bit higher in inflation in the UK. And uh, some European governments might take notice from the reaction of the market uh, to, uh, to, to, to the stimulus out of the UK. Mm. So perhaps we'll get a little bit less out of Germany than, than previously anticipated. And it, it, it remains to be seen what other uh, European governments are going to come out with. It's not yet fi finalized, but uh, I'm sure they are taking notice of the, yeah. <laughs> of the experience of the UK. Yeah, being in the UK is like living in a financial petri dish, it, it feels at the moment, Beata. Let me ask you what's going on with um, gas prices and whether this could be something that actually turns into a relative to weak expectations, a positive for European corporates. Because gas prices, yes, they're really elevated, still over 100 euros per megawatt hour, but they're way down from those highs around 350. Uh, of course, a lot will depend on the weather.
Yeah. Well, that would be a very uh, welcomed uh, fact if, if the gas prices continue to come down, right? But we worry that, you know, we, we haven't got into the winter yet. There are lots and lots of uncertainties and our commodity strategists think that there is going to be a huge volatility in the, uh, in the gas prices and also in the energy prices. So I worry we are not out of the woods yet, but definitely that, that would be very, very welcomed by the market and of course would limit uh, uh, the upside to inflation and perhaps uh, the reaction function of the central banks in terms of hiking, right? Yeah, even if uh, longer term gas strategies are still in question. Beata, thank you very much for joining us. Beata Manthi joining us there from City. Coming up on the programme, we will talk cars. Tesla reports after the bell today. More on what to expect from the automakers results next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, luxury car maker Rolls Royce has completed the first step towards fulfilling its promise to sell only electric vehicles by 2030. The CEO, Torsten Muller Otfuss, spoke about the company's EV transformation yesterday on Bloomberg. It's a prophecy fulfilled. Our founding father, Charles Rolls, said in 1900 that he foresees a great future for electric cars once charging is fixed and is available. And I think now we are here fulfilling his prophecy and uh, we are very excited. And our clients are, I mean, it's the very first time that you can acquire in the super luxury segment an electric car. So uh, it's the very first. And uh, for that reason, we are also immensely proud that we are the first. Obviously, it's a true Rolls-Royce and an electric Rolls-Royce second. And uh, that was very important for our clients. Are you going to put batteries in the Cullinan next? What's next for Rolls-Royce in terms of electrification? Yeah, I mean, I can't uh, ta uh, talk uh, today about, let's say, obviously all the next steps. But one promise is clear. By end of 2030, Matt, we will be fully electrified. So every future Rolls Royce we're going to bring into the market, every new one is a fully electrified Rolls Royce. So we are seizing uh, building combustion engine cars end uh, or the beginning of 2030. Torsten, let's talk about the profitability that is going to be um, with you when, when you make this, this full move uh, to electrification. You make a lot of money off building traditional ICE engine cars. Your margins have been phenomenal. Are you going to be able to match those margins when you go all electric? Yes, definitely, because that was always on my mind uh, when we had the plan to go electric. That is not a plan that was born uh, a year ago or whatever. We basically uh, came into it when we experimented for the very first time over 10 years ago with a, a prototype of an electric Phantom. And the client feedback was always fabulous. It fits to the brand great. But obviously we also knew that one day we go completely electric and for that reason contribution margins per car are untouched. They are as strong as they have used to be also in the past. For that reason, no worries. Rolls-Royce will stay a profitable, very profitable company. And that was the CEO of Rolls-Royce Motor Cars, Torsten muller Otfa, speaking to uh, me and Guy Johnson. Joining us now is Craig Trudell, Bloomberg's Global Autos Editor. Uh, so, Craig, we got the first electric uh, Rolls-Royce, the Spectre, on the, kind of on the Phantom platform. Um, what does this mean for the industry? I, I think it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how this one is received. I mean, obviously, we're, we're still a ways off, actually, from, from deliveries. We're about a year out from, from this actually uh, going to customers. But, you know, th this is, uh, I, I'll be very interested to see, you know, the, the weight, uh, the, the sort of specs of this one, because, you know, it, it is quite a boat. 6,559 pounds. <laughs> that's, uh, it's, uh, that's the spec Matt focused in on. <laughs> I, I should know better than to, to wonder what the specs are because I should have just checked with you, Matt. But, <laughs> but you know, this is this is an absolute boat. 
uh, you know, it, it is a, a, a car that, um, you know, it is, is going to be, you know, quite an investment. I do think it was interesting what we heard uh, from the company in terms of, you know, their, their expectations for the returns on this. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see if, if, you know, they're able to actually execute. They, you know, they sort of talk a big yeah. game about, you know, ex expectations being the same for these as their combustion cars. Uh, I do think that the early iterations are likely going to be extremely costly, and you're going to have to, uh, you know, uh, you know, naturally try some new things to to make such a fundamental change and what, uh, to to what you're selling. And and what a risk, right? I mean, to disappoint a right. Rolls Royce customer would be a giant problem for the brand. Um, indeed, that that car is heavier than the Cullinan, which is their gigantic SUV. Um, much lighter cars coming out of Tesla, of course, tried and true uh, over the last 10 years. We're going to get earnings after the bell. What do you expect, Craig? So I think the big uh, question is just going to be about demand. I, I think, you know, just three months ago, we were in the same position where uh, Elon Musk and, and the CF CFO, Zachary Kirkhorn, were being asked about this and whether the macro uh, situation was, was, you know, dragging a little bit. Uh, I think they sort of, you know, got a little bit, you know, exhausted with that question because they've sort of, you know, answered any questions about that uh, quarter after quarter going back years now. Uh, but then they sort of delivered a bit of a, a dud uh, just in the last few weeks in terms of their third quarter numbers and production significantly exceeded uh, uh, deliveries uh, last quarter. And so I think, you know, they're going to be in a similar, you know, seat uh, mm -hmm. three months later. Having to really address that head on, I think, you know, this sort of excuse that they're trying to move away from this end of quarter rush and, you know, yeah. kind of smooth deliveries out. Uh, I, I don't know that the street necessarily took that in stride. Yeah, we've heard that, haven't we? Uh, the stock then year to date, uh, Craig, down 35 percent or so. And one of the things that has weighed is the link between this company and Twitter and what Elon Musk wants to do with Twitter. Are we looking to get anything further on that today? I think that's also an, a topic that that may come up. I, I was surprised that it didn't really factor a whole lot in, in last quarter's earnings call. But I do think that, you know, the big uh, sort of concerns and overhangs there are twofold. It's, you know, how much of a distraction is this going to be for you, Elon? And two, are you going to have to sell more shares? He's obviously sold quite a bit of his uh, stake already. He's still by far the, the largest shareholder. But there is a concern that if he has to do some more selling, is that also, you know, going to drag on the stock? Yeah, absolutely. And, and also, if you have your chief executive officer making decisions like paying $44 billion for Twitter, um, what other uh, mistakes could he make? Craig, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Bloomberg's Craig Trudell there talking to us about uh, Rolls-Royce, Tesla, and earnings that are coming out later. We're going to continue on the autos front as well. BMW chairman and chief executive officer Oliver Tipsa joins us later today. That's at 12 p.m. New York time, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards out in London. Let's take a look now at what's ahead today on the data docket. U.S. MBA mortgage applications, building permits, housing starts uh, all coming, as well as the Fed Beige Book. We're going to hear more from the Fed presidents as well, including a Bloomberg interview with Jim Bullard. You don't want to miss. As we were talking about before, Tesla reports after the bell. Interesting to see the demand there, Craig was just telling us. And President Biden is expected to announce a plan to release 15 million barrels more of oil from the U.S. emergency reserves. He may consider significantly more this winter. Democrats have been under attack on gasoline prices as midterm elections near. And the question is, will depleting our energy, uh, emergency energy reserves, do anything about that? Anna? Yeah, let's get uh, some analysis on this then. Paul Wallace, Bloomberg Energy and Commodities Editor, is with us. And Paul, is it of market relevance or, or political relevance, do you think, that we're seeing this release uh, announced by the U.S. administration? And perhaps more significant, the, the flagging that more could come? Hi, Anna. I think after OPEC Plus's decision um, earlier this month to cut oil production, um, that markets and traders did expect um, the Biden administration to um, to release these uh, 15 million barrels um, um, of oil that it's uh, mentioned. And this is the final tranche of that massive 180 million barrel um, sell down that uh, Biden announced last 
uh, last year. So in and of itself, it's not too important. But I think that because of what OPEC Plus did, this probably just um, did uh, d did a little bit to to ensure that the White House would sell down this final tranche rather than holding off um, or, or perhaps waiting until next year. Um, we, we talked yesterday on radio with Scott Levine from Bloomberg Intelligence. He's a senior energy um, analyst for us here. He said, you know, it's not really the oil supply that's the problem in terms of U.S. pump prices. It's refining capacity. Is there anything the administration can do to boost that? That certainly is a massive problem, and you, if you look at the spreads between crude oil and, and diesel and gasoline, they're absolutely huge, and refiners are making huge, uh, big, big margins at the moment. In the short term, there is little the U.S. can do. I mean, it can't increase capacity because that, that takes years um, uh, that, that takes years and years. It can import more products, but the global market itself is very tight. I mean, if you look at uh, product spreads um, in Asia and Europe, they're also um, extremely high too. So I think this tightness in the, the diesel and the, and the gasoline markets is, is going to persist. There's just simply no um, obvious uh, solution to getting out of this. If anything, it might tighten further when we see the EU um, uh, ban uh, seaborne imports um, of, of diesel and gasoline from, from Russia uh, early next year. Is there anything that, is this in any way an answer to OPEC's cuts? From, from Biden, yes, I think this uh, um, it, it is possible they would have held off on this um, final tranche of SPR um, uh, releases in, until later in the year or even, even next year if OPEC Plus had held steady rather than cutting production. But I think there is a real concern um, at the White House, uh, within the White House and within the U.S. administration that uh, crude prices are going to mm. go up even further. Okay, Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Bloomberg's Paul Wallace with the latest on the oil markets. Still to come on Bloomberg TV, we'll get the White House take on oil reserves. We will speak to Armas Hogstein, who is a special presidential coordinator for global infrastructure and energy security. This is Bloomberg.